When the old gods vanished, our eyes opened. A new god, the many-headed Voskardlok, took to the fields and halls of the old gods and made them his own. He promised all would be safe under the watch of his many eyes, so long as they abided his laws. Some chose to remain, trading freedom for safety, but many of us chose to make our own way. Our brothers the ogres and trolls scattered to all corners of the world, while our sisters the mermaids claimed the meadows and reefs. Our ancestors, the seven daughters of the sky, flew across the shallow sea and made a home on these very mesas. Four of our sisters then took to the sky, one flying in each direction of the singing winds, hoping to find a perfect home. The three remaining sisters began to lay eggs. These were the great mothers, Koro the gold, Zinea the red, and Maru the black. The great mothers have since had many children, all of us here. We have made the mesas overlooking the prairie our home, though it is a dangerous place. Someday, our sisters will return with news of the world, and hopefully they will have found a safer place for us to call our true home. Of the many homunculi scattered throughout the known world and beyond, perhaps none have inspired such wonder as the Children of the Skies. Called Sirens and Harpies by the Assembly, these winged beings mostly live in Nikari Mesas north of the known world, though there are harpies also found in the highlands of Arvel and Picardia, along with reports from Kairu. Their wings, and all below the waist, primarily resemble teratorns, though as with all homunculi, these are actually the genetics of humans. In the case of harpies, they are homo sapiens, not homo altus like the ogres. There are elements of other birds, such as eagles, but mostly teratorns make up the morphological base. Though there are many colors, it appears the size of the black teratorn, being about as heavy as a person, made them ideal candidates. Unsurprising given their size, harpies are not acrobatic flyers. They cannot take off from a standstill, either needing a running start or some height to launch. This appears to be a factor in living in highlands like mesas and mountains, though these roots also give them a great vantage point to employ their exceptional vision and safety for most predators that could pose a threat. Harpies may have supernatural healing, typical of other advanced homunculi, but they aren't impervious to damage by any means, and can be slain by such predators as big cats, hyenas, cockatrices, and of course, larger predators like terror birds and megaraptorans. Harpies have extremely demanding metabolisms. Even with photosynthetic supplements, they need around three times as much food as a human of the same size. They are primarily carnivores, though housey harpies eat a lot of ginkgo nuts. When hunting small game like gazelles, small camels, and hares, they generally prefer to grab it while still on the wing. Stopping and hunting on the ground makes them vulnerable, especially since flying before landing advertises their position to other predators. Larger game present a bit of a challenge. They sometimes injure large prey by derping rocks or poison darts on them, but a big carcass on the prairie is going to draw a lot of unwanted attention. Harpies can do hunt in groups, and can bring down large game quickly. Using tools made by hand or traded with Tolani nomads, they can butcher quite a bit of meat quickly, but they must act fast. A few hyenas and cockatrices can easily scare off by the imposing spread of their 5-7 to seven meter wingspan, but once one of these scavengers braves a strike, several harpies can quickly go from dominating a kill to being added to the feast. There are no male harpies. All are female and reproduce by laying eggs that contain clones. 
Because of this, the three harpy lineages on the prairie each have a distinct appearance and are consistent with their matriline. These three lineages include black, red, and golden harpies. The harpies reported in Arvel and Picardia either have black or silver wings. These are not as well understood, but believed to have had a similar lifestyle and appearance to prairie herpes, though they tend to have their own torsos and arms also covered with feathers, whereas much more of the prairie harpy is exposed. It is unknown if this is how they were made or if this was an adaptation to colder climates. Even cloned offspring can mutate, after all, and the magic within homunculi is well documented to adapt to a host of different climate pressures over time. In most instances, the original homunculi created by the first children are long gone, only survived by their cloned or reproduced descendants. Beast folk and ogres, for example, are all the best known for sexually reproducing descendants who age and often die of old age after a few centuries. Harpies, however, have several original homunculi in their midst. Among the prairie harpies, there are three first mothers, Koro the Gold, Zinea the Red, and Maru the Black. Maru is the leader of the colonies though all three First Mothers have command over their respective matrilines. This control is not absolute, where there is certainly a degree of mental subjugation magic, shared thought, and general behavioral influence, the First Mothers do not completely control their daughters. Mostly they cooperate without issue, but some harpies have broken free of the First Mother's influence. This was the case for Yelena, a descendant of Maru who broke free of her ancestors' mental subjugation in Songbird's Lament, a novella in my first anthology. The sensory function of harpies is the subject of much interest in the assembly. Their visual acuity is extremely high, and they can effectively transition between seeing for many miles and adjusting for much closer inspection. They are able to partially see in the ultraviolet spectrum, allowing for not only them to see their prey and its traces with a glow, they can also detect electromagnetic fields, which they call wind songs. Wind songs are partially seen and felt due to trace elements of magnetite in their noses, but most importantly, it can be faintly heard. The harpies say the songs can guide them on long hunts, especially since the mesas are at an intersection of several wind songs. Though most harpies just use the fields to know direction. Harpies have a relationship with the Dolani and other Shu nomads, though it is relegated to only a few interactions, and even that is tenuous. Neither the Great Library, Assembly, nor Empire are trusted, even when vouched for by the Dolani, who themselves are often skeptical of outsiders. This means that a lot of understanding of harpies is second or even third-hand information. One harpy did have direct contact with a pair of Assembly agents, and either disputed or cooperated some of the information on the Children of the Skies, but this obviously accounts for only one perspective, so paints an incomplete picture. In Songbird's Lament, Maria Elena is a harpy living in the Mesa colonies. When a solitary hunting mission is part of her coming-of-age ceremony, she sees an imperial scouting party ambushed by ogres. Maria Elena rescues a member of the company, a musically inclined ranger named Raylan. A storm passes through and the pair are trapped together for several days, during which time a budding romance begins. Unfortunately, she is discovered by one of her relatives. Maria Elena knows her family will not tolerate an imperial in their midst, and as they flee, Maria Elena braves a confrontation with her ancient ancestor in defense of Raylan. The pair escape thanks to some Megaraptoran intervention, and they make their way to the ranger outpost, hoping Raylan's people will be more receptive. Thank you so much to Ian for sponsoring this episode. Songbird's Lament certainly isn't the last we'll see of Yelena and Maru. I haven't finalized the next anthology, but Yelena's next adventure might be included. 
Next week, we will meet the Hazuki, demons of frost and famine that were the antagonist of a novella series beginning in Tales of Chimere, continuing in Songs of the Inland Sea, and will reach a conclusion in the third anthology, Cries from Beyond the Known World, coming out sometime later this year. Not exactly sure when. Thank you so much to my Patreon patrons for your support of this project. Your contribution is how I'm able to devote so much time to the project, as I have without needing to return to a day job, and your support is deeply appreciated. I also couldn't do this without sponsors like Ian, so thank you very much for that. Last but not least, cheers to you for watching. Every little bit helps. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks.